Mohamed Nawaz should not be bowling this over. A spinner bowling to 20th in Australia is a misuse of allocations. So his best chance of winning is trying to squeeze a ball into the pads to give the batter no room. In front of him is not a specialist, just a bowler who bats. But when he goes for those pads, they aren't there because the batter has moved them. He knew what was coming and with two runs needed from one ball and hundreds of millions of people watching an India-Pakistan match, what does R. Ashwin do? He leaves the ball. The next delivery, he wins the game with a lofted drive and people still talk about the gutsy, crazy Machiavellian leave more than the final shot. Even Ashwin said that if it went wrong, he might have retired on the spot. And here we are talking about the last over of a T20 game where he left a ball, despite the fact that we are celebrating the latest man to enter the 500 test wicket club. But that last over leave is why Ashwin is so good. Sure, we could tell you something about like when Ben Stoke attempts to block an Ashwin delivery that is full and flighted, he looks to defend it, but the ball turns, grips and crashes into his off stump. A classic off spinner's dismissal. But none of that is new. Ashwin eats the souls of left-handers. He ends their bloodlines. That was the 12th time he dismissed the English skipper and no one has ever taken more left-hand wickets than R. Ashwin. His ability to dominate left-handers like no one else is incredible, but more predictable. That isn't what makes him remarkable. He is an off-spinner, he is supposed to dominate left-handers. But what makes him great is how he thinks about every other facet of his game. R. Ashwin is the king of five-day cricket. And he used all of these skills to take 500 wickets, the ninth person to do this in test matches. That cements his greatness. But where does he rank alongside the other legendary spinners and Indian bowlers of all time? So if you need a VPN, go Nord. Use nordvpn.com forward slash Kimber to get a huge discount off your Nord VPN plan plus four additional months for free. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. The link is in the show notes. Protect your computer like a cricketer protects its nether region with NordVPN today. India has had great bowlers before, and Ashwin is not even the only one from India on the 500 club. But Ashwin stands out because he has the third best average in this group of bowlers, and only merely is ahead among the tweakers. That's a hell of a record. With this many wickets at a great average, those who like huge victim totals will love him, but it also gives something to those people who adore low bowling averages. But like Jimmy Anderson, questions always follow him around, especially away. However, his record by venue country-wise is actually pretty good. An average of less than 25 in three countries and an average of under 30 in all but two. However, his home record is definitely the standout. Australia and South Africa are the obvious ones to struggle with because, you know, he's an off-spinner. And plenty of great bowlers have done far worse in those kinds of conditions. But you can't really ignore Australia and England because those two countries where he's played a lot of cricket. Of course, any player from the big three spends so much time in that triangle. After a while, it does start to define them. This shows his genius really well. Lyon is a different kind of off-spinner, more plug and play. He will land the ball on the same spot with subtle changes and wait for the mistakes to come. Ashwin in Australia learned how to be a hunter. You know, he went upwind in camouflage and started controlling his breaths. His performance have gone from being significantly worse in the first tour to par in the next one and now much better in the last couple. And so while his overall record in Australia doesn't look that good, he learned how to improve that until he was better than Lyon because Ashwin will always do the work. In an interview with the Cricket Monthly, he talked about planning for six months against Steve Smith and Manus Labuschagne. He studied their batting styles closely and devised a plan for the Australian tour of 2021. But then there's England as well. His average looks good here without context. And a mark of 33 against England in England is fine, but their home spinners have been better than him in these games. Mel and Ali picked up nine wickets in a Southampton test of 2018. Ashwin took three. India eventually lost that match by 60 runs. Is there something to be said for him looking at Australia as the big enemy and maybe not preparing as much for England? Or it could just be that his version of magic doesn't quite work as well on those pitches. But the fact that he still does okay in England certainly lets you know that he will find a way, like he did in the WTC final against New Zealand, where he actually lowered his average in England to 28 overall. And if you look at his record outside of Asia, there is a very interesting trend here. It's against the southpaws. He is significantly better than against the right-handers. But in Asia, while he prefers the goofy-footed, he's still ruthless against both kinds of batting. 
Put it this way, in Asia, he is a destroyer of worlds. In Senna, he's more of a matchup beast. But of course, Ashwin is mostly known for what he does inside of India. He has the fifth best average of all bowlers with 200 wickets at home. And some of that is because he combines with Jadeja and Asim attack who have been absolutely incredible. You know, with wickets falling pretty quickly from the other end, it makes it a lot easier for him to pick up fresh batters. But it's not just from him playing on suitable wickets. His performances actually more than hold up when he's playing on batting friendly surfaces at home. When you can average 20 runs less than others on flat wickets, that is low key super villain. And the truth is when the conditions aren't massively in his favor at home, he just activates a whole new level. Like a jazz musician, he improvises until something sticks. You are talking about a bowler who once delivered around the wicket and then ended the follow through by being over the wicket. He was running across the pitch in front of the umpire to swap places. Why did he do this? To create a new angle that no batter had ever faced before. If anything, sometimes he improvises too much because there is just so much going on in his head. But that is also the key to him being so good in the first innings of a match. Because if India bowl first, he is way better than the other spinners. But by the second innings, he's even further in front. The other bowlers only start to catch him at the end of games, even though he's still obviously better than that. And I suppose that part of the game is almost boring to him, just bowling on a spot. Who wants to do that? But for a normal spinner, that is where they eat because they need the ball to be ragging to take control. Ashwin can be a predator on early innings flat wickets. And if he can't find a wicket normally, he will adapt to whatever he has to. Because he's an engineer, there is the crease. If you leave it, you can be run out. He sees cricket in code. He has no place for your earnest feelings or beloved spirits. And think about his batting. Guys with this level of bowling talent usually don't bat all that much at all. Ashwin has more hundreds than the other nine of the 500 club combined. Ashwin is not a fully fledged all-rounder, but he can certainly hold a bat and also gives a lot of utility with it. Two of his most memorable batting performances have been in fourth innings chases. The first was at the SCG where he partnered with Vahari and they stonewalled the Australian attack for three hours to draw the test while nursing back pain. It was kind of like watching an uncle with a hernia hold off an army. The Mirpur innings was also significant. His partnership with Shreyas Iyer took India from 74 to 7 to actually get home in a 145 run chase. The other interesting thing is that both those results were very important in the WTC final qualifications. However, his batting peak is long gone. He actually started as an opener in junior cricket. Until 2016 in tests, his average was nearly 35. Ever since, it has nosedived to slightly more than 20. And a lot of this is just because he's slower now. He was never a hard running, high jumping athlete, but he certainly doesn't have the flexibility in his body he once had. Although his overall average is slightly warped by the 10 not outs, he was a better test batter early on than Jadeja. But since 2017, Sir Ravi J averages more than twice of what Ashwin does. And he's been a regular number six and number seven with the bat, even number five when needed. In 2016-17, Ashwin actually batted quite a few times in the top seven. India played all their games in Asia and the West Indies at that point. So Ashwin being in the top order allowed them to use five bowlers even when they didn't have Jadeja. And to be honest, at his best, in Asian conditions, he was probably an all-rounder. Which again, is just incredibly handy. So it's pretty obvious that he prefers spin bowling. And if anyone should understand it, it would be him, right? And there is a noticeable gap in his average against the two bowling types. His lack of fast twitch movements is probably a part in this. So his record in and outside of Asia also makes sense. But here is what I think is more interesting though. Even away from Asia, he still finds a way. At home, he's a low end all rounder, but away, he's a top quality number eight. And this goes further than test cricket. Even in T20, which wouldn't normally suit his batting style, he found a way to have an impact. By promoting him to play spin, he either bats as the pinch hitter and sometimes pinch blocker, while also moonlighting as a bit of a low usage all rounder. Again, he isn't quite that good, but that isn't the point with Ashwin. It's that he's willing to try anything to maximize himself in every single situation. Think about it this way. Ashwin can take 500 test wickets with a low average, make five test hundreds, pinch hit in T20, and can get run outs without actually delivering the ball. He is always in the game, but we are talking about him because of the spin. And India have had great tweakers before. Bishop Beatty has a bowling average of 14.5 in the fourth innings, and he bowled lullabies for his entire career. But as brilliant as the great man was, Ashwin on wickets and average really is something completely different. 
But what about Harpajan Singh, the other great modern Indian off spinner? He took a lot of wickets, but again, his average was not really the same. One major difference has to be Harbhajan's record at home. He was excellent until 2005, and then his record ballooned. Perhaps the pitches started to play a part here, but you can't deny the fact that he wasn't quite the same bowler anymore. Now Ravi Jadeja enters the chat. This is his partner, and also the reason that Ashwin hasn't played as much away from home as we'd all like. That has probably slowed down his development as a bowler, which is actually kind of scary to think of. But while Jadeja takes him as an overall package, purely as a bowler in terms of wickets, there is no real comparison between the two. However, Sir Ravi J can still catch the man who asked us not to call him Ravi. But that conversation is ongoing, and for now, the older man is in front. So that leaves us with Anil Kumble. He was basically our Ashwin before social media existed. So is Ashwin better than Kumble, all things considered? If we are constructing an all-time Indian side and you only get to pick one, Ashwin makes more sense with his batting. But what about just as a bowler? And I know to many people, this entire conversation will seem ridiculous. Look at the difference of their averages. But Anil Kumble was special. Of all the great post-war spinners, he's the only one you'd probably back yourself to get through an over from. You wouldn't actually survive, but compared to Warren or Murali, you wouldn't be completely embarrassed either. You would, however, miss the straight one. And were it not for his constant wipes at that sweaty forehead, you would wonder if he was actually truly human. What sort of a spinner bowls that many balls on a good length with grace, patience, and no actual spin? And as a batter, you can understand, if not actually play, a freak like Warren or Murley. You are going up against their incredible physical gifts in a kind of a game of survival. They will keep you up at night in fear. As a batter, your questions are, how do I keep missing the straight ones? And why does he only ever beat me with a lack of spin? Facing Kumble was an existential threat to your stumps that became literal. You were trying to think of all the different things he can do, and then he bowls a straight one. And while you are grappling with the true meaning of life, he's appealing for another LBW. It feels like Kumble played in another world entirely. But remember, he did take an extraordinary number of victims, often on pitches that modern fans wouldn't even recognize as Indian wickets. So while most people would assume this is not even a conversation, remember that Kumble should end up with more wickets, although that is probably more in doubt now. So let us dive deep. This is Kumble's record in India, and we can see he's also a fair bit better than the other Indian spinners that he played with, like Harbhajan and Ben Katapati Raju. He's also done much better than the Turing Tweakers in his era. And you have to consider that this includes two of the greatest spinners or just bowlers of all time, Warner Murley. When you compare their records and the games they played against each other, it's not even close. Kumble outbowls them by a mile when they came to India. But as great as Ashwin has been, he's also had top-notch support at the other end in the form of Ravi Jadeja and Akshar Patel. Also, none of the visiting spinners in India, bar Lion, Swan and Harath, have been top tier. And even Rangana only played a couple of matches where he bowled less than 50 overs combined. And we've talked about them in Australia, but in India, it isn't particularly close. Ashwin is just much better. And the only time Lion had a better average was in 2017, and even then, it was marginal. He does become a much better bowler in Asia, and you can see that in 2023. It's just that Ash is on a whole other level by that point, where the last parts of his soft athleticism are matched with his supercomputer brain. Ashwin went up against Swan just once in 2012, which also happens to be the last time a visiting side won a test series in India. Although Ashwin was just starting out, and it was the second time that Swanee had come to India. But it wasn't even close between the two. And it's worth remembering that Kumble did not have the luxury of being a support bowler in India's greatest seam attack for a significant part of his career. And he was usually paired with Harbhajan as the second spinner, who was good, but nothing like Ashwin's support. And take Ashwin's team spin average with a pinch of salt, because 9 wickets at 54, all of those are part-timers except for a few from Tadeja. In that period, Ash has 71 wickets, so he essentially plays as a lone spinner overseas in all but four tests. And that's when he's paired with Jadeja. And of course, neither Kumble or Ashwin have been particularly great on the road compared to Warren and Murley, but those two are goat goats. Even if you look at Ashwin's numbers in isolation since 2018, which is when he got a lot better, it coincides with the fact that that's when India's pace attack finally peaked. This certainly suggests that Ashwin just had a whole different level of support on the road. So Ashwin is much better than the average spinner in his era, certainly compared to Kumble. 
But Kumble's career also coincides with the two greatest spinners or two of the greatest bowlers of all time. Other spinners average 33 in the games Ashwin plays, while they average just a little above 40 in Kumble's case. This tells you about the difference in the pitches these two men had to bowl on. And when we actually adjust for that in match factor, the difference between these two suddenly slims a lot. There is no doubt that Kumble had to play on surfaces far more difficult, so he was always going to have a higher average. For me, this is probably the most important metric as it actually factors in the pitches as well. But even then, Ashwin was better and not by that much. The truth is, to get a true answer here, you would need an Ashwin level mind to look at the records of these two ball by ball. And when he retires, Ashwin might write a thesis on where he rates inside India and the world's all-time list. But I think he's pretty comfortably in the top two best bowlers India has ever had. And I think it would be hard to make a case for him not being number one. And because of who he is, I think that sometimes we overemphasize the brain and left field tendencies of the man. And when it comes down to it, just as a pure off spinner, he is about as good as we have ever seen. Flight, drift, accuracy, and spin are all there every ball. But even when he looks normal, we know that what lies beneath is someone desperate to do things on a cricket field that have never been done before. And when you look at his career in totality, he has definitely done that. A lot of people complain that I'm not a former cricketer and so that I don't really know the game. Well, you know what they can't claim? Then I don't know desks. I've been using desks for years. I'm a collector of desks, old and new, and I am sitting on a new one right now. I am the Don Bradman of sitting at desks. So when I tell you that the E7 Pro next generation height adjustable desk from FlexiSpot is legit, this is like Michael Jordan talking to you about sneakers. This desk holds 160 kilograms. It is as stable as anything I've ever seen, and it has under desk cable management. But really, the main skill here is that this desk rises and falls at the push of a button, and it moves super quick. And it has so many settings that remember your favorite heights. It really does it all. And I could not recommend the E7 Pro from FlexiSpot anymore, even though I am currently sitting on one of FlexiSpot's BS12 Pro multifunctional adjustable upgraded fabric ergonomic chairs. My butt and computer have never been happier than when using one of FlexiSpot's products. So get over to their page right now for big savings.